Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is David Craig. I'm a committee member of the Australian Archaeological Society and uh, I run a mapping uh, drone and mapping business. Um, technically I'm retired but I'm still working because there's still work to do. Um, so this lecture or talk or tutorial or whatever you want to call it is really just for anybody who wants to find out a little bit more about their, um, their own environment using uh, some of the maps that are available online. And uh, so I'm going to be going through uh, several tools. Uh, the first one is going to be the Department of Communities uh, Historic uh, Environment Viewer. Um, I'll just be going a brief rundown through the various options and, and some of the more useful uh, aspects of, of using that tool uh, to look at old maps, to look at um, um, the aerial maps from the Ordnance Survey in Northern Ireland, which is also all on that. So I'll be taking you through that. Um, then I'll be having a quick look at Google Earth. Um, Google Earth is a downloadable program. It's available for Mac and PC, and it gives uh, a number of years views of the aerial env environment. Uh, so I'll be running through that. It's one of the biggest tools for trying to find archaeological features using aerial maps. Um, so, and I'll be looking at a few others as well. There is another website, which I'll share with you later on, uh, outside of Google Earth and uh, the Sites and Monuments Register, um, uh, which gives us just a, a, another set of data that's not in Google. Um, to, to get at these things, I'm going to share my screen now, if I can. Uh, this, is my, this is my own website. Um, I've created a, um, uh, a menu item at the top there. You can see it's about contact us blog and there's community. If you click on community, um, it'll give two options, one here, it says aerial satellite and map viewers, and the other one underneath is other useful websites. So uh, this one here, the top one, click on that. It gives just a, buttons and a list of how to get to some of these things because some of them are a little convoluted. Uh, you can find most of these things on, just by searching for them on Google. And the most, um, the first we're going to look at is the sites and monuments map viewer for, for Northern Ireland. But they're all here. There's Apple Maps on any device. There's the Microsoft Bing Maps. There's Google Maps, um, the Public Records Office Map Viewer, which is very similar to the Historic Environment Viewer. Um, there's the Republic of Ireland versions uh, there as well. Mapbox is another one. Um, and then Google Earth Pro, that's where you can download from that link um, to install Google Earth Pro on your own computer afterwards. This has been recorded and will be available on YouTube as well. Uh, so you can go back and and uh, look at a few things if you happen to miss it. Um, this next one, the Northern Ireland Sites and Monuments Register file for Google Earth Pro um, gives you a, a link to download that. I'll explain that a little bit more as we go on into it. There's various other ones there, flooding maps, for example, which is quite handy from the era, which lets you see what the landscape would be like if it was flooded which is more like what it would have been like in uh, prehistoric times. Um, there's also a link there to the Down Survey of Ireland. Um, so there, there, I'm going to be adding to this list as time goes on. Um, if you find any of them are broken, the link, links don't work, please email me and I'll try and fix them. I haven't looked at it for a while. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. Now I'm going to have to hop in and out here, but I've got to change my screen to Right, can everybody see that? Yeah. Yep. That's the yeah. So we're now looking at a full screen version of the Sites and Monuments Register, which you can get to from that link that's on, on my web page. You can search for it yourself on Google. Um, it's a bit convoluted finding it on gov.uk or, or direct NI, whatever it's called. Uh, it is in there, but it's, you've got to click on several links to get to it. Um, um, it's just it's easier to see right on my uh, page there. So this is this is really what it looks like. 
straight off uh, whenever you go in. Um, I'm just going to do a refresh on it here because it's important. This is what it looks like when you first go in. It takes a second or two and it comes up with this. Come up with a copyright notice. And usually this stuff is just bump, you just read it and or you don't read it and you just do okay. But it has one interesting um, uh, part of it. Uh, there's an email address in there. You see it says haroni at communities-ni.gov.uk. That's the email address to send something to. If you happen to find something on Google Earth or any of these maps, if you happen to find an archaeological feature or what you think is an archaeological feature, that's the email address to, to send the location to so that, so that um, HED, Historic Environment uh, Division, knows what it is. So that, that link there is quite important. Um, the rest of it is just uh, the usual copyright notice. You just do OK. OK, so uh, you can use your central wheel on your mouse if you're using a mouse. Um, even if you have a laptop, it's worth using a mouse just to have this zoom in, zoom out feature, because it's just so easy to do, to zoom out and to zoom in again. Um, and holding the mouse button down, it makes it slide about. It's very common to most of these mapping, mapping things. Um, so the very first, at the top right hand corner, you see a dark blue bar there uh, with several icons on it. So I'm going to go through some of those. I'm not going to go through them all because some of them are uh, some are broken and don't work. Um, uh, historic Environment Division are aware that the map viewer, there's certain aspects of it don't work. Um, and they're, they've been working on it for like about nine months and nothing's really changed. So I'm not sure what's happening. New items are not being added to the public viewer at the minute uh, because they can't do it um, for some reason. They, they are look, um, registering them in the, in the back end database that they're on. And when they get the problem fixed, uh, the new sites will become available. I don't think there's been any new sites publicly added to this viewer since last summer. Um, so we'll have a look at the first one. Uh, no, the first thing we'll look at is the very bottom right-hand corner, down where it says, you can see it says Powered by Esri. A little bit of text button, because there's a little arrow down there. See it, a little arrow. If you click on that arrow, it will show you a little um, junior version of the main screen. Now that's quite useful. Um, sorry. That if you zoom in on an area, say you zoom in on, uh, say, Oma here, and you're looking at a certain area, um, you can then um, click that little arrow. And it shows the rough area that you're looking at with the gray box. Sometimes, if you're going to be using copies of these maps that you've in a, in a publication or even your own report, it's handy to have a reference point. Whereabouts is this site I'm looking for or I'm looking at? It gives a little gray box, shows you around. You can make that full screen actually. I just hit full screen. So it shows you Oma, you can see the little gray box, and that's the area um, that, that you're looking at. I'm sorry, you're going to have a cat that might walk past you occasionally. There's its tail walking past. So I'll do my best to try to keep her out of the picture. Um, I can click that back again. So it's down the, in the bottom corner, that little arrow, outwards facing arrow, that's what that does. Uh, let switch it again, it switches itself off. Um, just while we're here, at the very bottom of the screen, um, where it says um, the Crown Copyright Database Rights 2020, um, if you're ever going to use any of these maps uh, from the map viewer in a publication, um, you should really uh, select that, copy and paste it. I'm just going to do it now. I just select it, copy and paste it. and into your document because that gives them the copyright um, uh, credit that they require whenever you're using any of these these things. Um, for your own personal use, it doesn't really matter, but they're just tools that are there on, on the main screen. Okay, so we're going to go to the very top now. Um, that dark blue bar at the right hand side, uh, the first one is just the legend. Um,
So the green dots, the very first one there is the sites and monuments, that's the green dots. Um, pretty hard to see there actually. Um, the, the dots have a little black line around them, so um, it's, it's pretty hard to see. Um, historic buildings are on this as well. Uh, and it also gives you a list of those that are listed and delisted in their status. So the wee purple circles are listed buildings and tell you the date and things. Um, the defense heritage, anything to do with Second World War features, um, will be a yellow dot. Industrial heritage, that is flax mills, water mills, windmills, uh, that sort of thing, uh, will all be a little blue dot. Historic parks and gardens are a green outlined shaded area. You can see one there uh, in Oma. Um, scheduled zones is, is a similar one, but a red color. Uh, those are archaeological sites that are, have been scheduled by HED, that is, they have some sort of status of protection uh, against development uh, and about what you can do on, on that particular area. And you see those, uh, the more I zoom out. If I zoom back a little bit, we'll probably find one or two. Uh, it says here, nothing's showing up at the minute. Oh, yes, well, that, there's one little red one there. You see it there? I'm not quite sure what that is, but we'll, um, if I click the little green dot that's in the middle, it'll, it'll tell me. It's a trackway, um, and it says the age is uncertain. Bronze Age wooden trackway. So that's, I didn't even know that was there. I just picked up by, by sheer random. Um, it also tells you at the top here what the sites and monument um, reference number is for that particular site. So that obviously the, the, the scheduled area restricts development uh, within that trackway area. Um, there's battle sites as well as shown. There's a few of those you'll probably find as you work along. And there's the marine protected uh, areas as well. These are um, ships that they don't want um, people diving on uh, for, because uh, they, same as protected areas on land, they, they can be damaged very easily by excessive diving. Um, so the next one, next little icon over is a stacked, little stacked squares. This is probably the most useful one. Um, because it shows you all those things shows you the sites of monuments, a list of sites of monuments from so the historic buildings, defense heritage, uh, et cetera, et cetera. If you think of these, this list here as layers of a map. So if you can imagine the analogy of uh, a base map, right, a solid big A2 size map, and you put a layer of tracing paper down over top of that. And that will, if that tracing paper has all the roads marked on it. It's another layer. And then another layer on top of that might be the houses. So you can understand the principle of layering in this. That's what this list is. So the sites and monuments register, uh, the top one there will be at the top layer of what is displayed on your screen. Um, there's, there's other ones. Um, have to move all your pictures out of the way because they're on my screen so I can see everything right. Okay. so. Um, if you if you switch the uh, say pick one here um, scheduled zones, you see this one here scheduled zones. It's ticked at the minute. If I tick that off, you'll see this red area scheduled area disappear off our base map. I can switch it back on again. And again, if I switch the sites of monuments one off, that green dot in the middle will also disappear. So it's a way of, of switching off these layers because it can get a bit cluttered sometimes. And it comes up with a default layer, um, sorry, de default layers that are highlighted and visible. I, first thing I do usually is go in and switch a lot of them off. You know, if you're not interested in historic buildings, for example, switch it off. That means there'll be less dots appearing on the screen. Yeah. If you're not interested in defense heritage, that off. I'm just going to concentrate on the archaeological ones. So I'm going to, I'd maybe leave the industrial heritage because they're flax mills and windmills and things like that. 
Um, historic parks and gardens, that's the big green areas, that really colors things up as well. The scheduled zones are just wider areas um, of, of scheduling. Um, and the bottle sites are leaves switched on as well. So I'll mm -hmm. zoom back a wee bit so we can see a bit more. Um, if you zoom out too much, the little dots disappear. So you can still see the green dots there. And every green dot represents an archaeological feature because I switched everything else off, or most things off. If I pick this one in the middle here, I have no idea what it is. If I click on it, tell that's the same one. That's the trackway, isn't it? Yeah, that's the same one. I'll pick another one. Another one there. Yep. This one says the site type is an AP site. AP means aerial photography site. Some um, usually the older um, uh, military black and white uh, imagery. Uh, if, if something shows up in one of them, they'll say that that's where it's uh, seen. They won't. They can't usually tell what it is. But it's a, it's this one, and this one it says a double ditched enclosure. Um, if you zoom in on that, you'll see more where it is. Well, you've got to remember too that most of this, these, these are all on private ground. Um, so if you were going to visit any of them. Uh, there's probably no reason why you shouldn't, but go to the nearest house and ask. You know, um, if they, if they don't own the land, they'll they'll tell you, oh, so and so owns that down the road. It's always better to get permission and uh, talk to landowners about what what you want to have a look at. Um, so the base map in the background here that we're looking at is a modern day. Um, in fact, it's very up to date. I was looking at one uh, at, at the Newton Arts area and the new little store is on it, which is only opened this last nine months or so. And it, it's now on it. So it's just a background um, layer to show you roughly where things are. Um, I'm going to go down this list a little bit now. So remember, these are layers. I'm going to go down to this one here, where it says OSNI Orthophotography Current. That just means it's the Ordnance Survey aerial, aerial Photography, um, a bit like Google, Google Maps and Google, Google Earth. But it's done by the Ordnance Survey. It was commissioned by the Ordnance Survey um, in Northern Ireland. So if I click that on, the whole image changes. And now you're looking at uh, the uh, the most recent. It doesn't give a date, I don't think, uh, as to, as to what, what that is. Um, there is another one underneath that, which is very similar. It says Ordnance Survey Northern Ireland, Orthophotography 2018. The reason that's there um, is they did a subsection of Northern Ireland, not, the, not all of Northern Ireland, but they flew a lot of Northern Ireland in, two, in 2018. Uh, that was that particularly dry summer. Um, Barry Hartwell, he's there, I think. We remember that's the summer that we did um, Balanahari and got such good results. Um, it's quite good to look at um, because it, because it was so dry, you tend to get crop marks showing up in these uh, barley and wheat fields a little bit more, but it doesn't cover all of Northern Ireland. Now the, the next one underneath that, we're, we're into the six inch maps now. So the, next, the first one is Ordnance Survey County Series first series, and that was published round about 1830. It does vary a little bit. But if I click that on now with the arrow, nothing will happen. That's because the layer above it is switched on, the, the ordinance. Surface. So I would have to switch off the, uh, the aerial photography one in order to see the six inch maps. So here we can see the very first series of six inch maps that was done uh, across all of Northern Ireland. And they're very detailed. Um, you can zoom right in. Uh, lots of all kind of um, townland boundaries are, are marked. Um, buildings that are probably long gone. Uh, a little spring well there in this particular spot we're, we're looking at. So it's a great way of trying to see the oldest maps really that we have covering a very wide area. Um, 
And sometimes you see hints of old villages that may even be in the remains of a, of a medieval village, for example. You make a cluster of houses, uh, which is maybe um, telling, starting to tell a little bit of a story there. So we can zoom in and slide about and look at all this. You have to pick your own areas. I'm not going to be picking any particular area here. I'm just trying to be random about it. Uh, I'll pick one here. There's a green dot in the middle of this little area. It looks like it could be a rath with little fields around it. Enclosure, it says. Um, but quite interesting, if, if there was an enclosure there, there might have been buildings inside. You might see a crop mark, maybe, if you looked at the um, orthophotography. I'll just click it on. And you see what it looks like. But you see the field boundaries that you saw in the 1830s six inch map, you can't see those because they're not there anymore. So it's very useful. Um, we're trying to see, just to get an understanding of what the environment is like around the area that you're wanting to, to, to study. The other ones underneath this list are just uh, slightly more modern ones. Next one down is the 1860s. Um, the, the 1830s one tends to not show ordinary field boundaries. If I, if I zoom on back here, try and get into them work. Uh, there are some field boundaries are showing here, uh, but they tended to show field boundaries in the six in, the, in that first series as a little tick. See the little ticks going across the line. That is actually one end of a field boundary that extended all the way across to the little tick on the other side. Um, so if I look at the 1860s one, the next one, I've got to switch this one off first and switch this one on. Now, I might have to zoom back a little bit to see it. Yeah. If you're not seeing anything, zoom back a little bit. And uh, it'll pop it. now it's showing you all the field boundaries. And you'll, you'll find compared to now, if I switch on the aerial photography again, um, you see that a lot of the field boundaries are gone. Looking at this this area here, for example, there's one, two, three, four, five, six. If you look at that, all those fields are gone. But it's giving you a hint of what was there before. Sometimes you can still see a crop mark in a field where the whole field boundary used to be. Um, we can see one in this field here. You can see a light patch going across there. Another dark bit going across there. Another. Those are probably older field boundaries. So if you switch the uh, 1860, um, 1861 back on again. Sorry, I need to zoom back to see it. Yeah, you you, you can see um, it, it, it looks completely different. Um, so as a way of um, dismissing what you think might be a feature when it might just be an old field boundary. So it's very, uh, so you have to, uh, to go through a process of elimination, uh, trying to find these things. And these go right on up. Uh, the, ne the next map down is the 1900s, then 1905, uh, and then the, the, the more modern ones. There, there, there's not always full coverage. If I zoom right back here, like way back, yeah. See over at the left hand side of the screen here is a big white blank. Um, there just was no map available for um, for HED to scan in order to get this in. Um, so that particular second series um, isn't available for that area. So it's a way of building up a picture. Really what we're trying to do with these maps is try to tell the story of a particular area and um, depending on what your purpose is, it could be just for personal study, it could be just curiosity, what was, my, what was in my area, uh, maybe your own land as a farm, uh, what was my farm look like in the 1830s, you can, you can see all that. Um, so there's lots of different purposes that you can use these tools for. Um, so that's, that's, ba that's basically the, the layers. Uh, tab there, you, so you can switch any of these up, but you must remember to switch the previous one, the one above it off, because uh, it might be hiding. If I switch that on again, you see the aerial shows up. Switch it off again, the, the layer below that shows up. So, so it can be a bit confusing at times when you 
click something here, speak the, the tick appear and it doesn't appear, but it's just because there was something else, another layer on top of it. So you can see that on that, that there are quite a few gaps. Uh, it's probably a bit too far out for you to see over Zoom, but there's another one there, uh, top corner Loch Ney. That, that, sec that second series doesn't exist. Well, it doesn't exist as far as the map viewer is concerned. Probably if you went in the HED and actually, or went onto the Prony maps, uh, you may, you, you may, which is very similar to this, uh, you may find that, that it may be available um, in that. Um, back up to our top toolbar again. Uh, the next one across is uh, a little book with a bookmark hanging out of it. You can probably guess what that is. It's a bookmark. So if you find a particular site and you want to be able to get back to it again next week or next year to have a look at it again, you can bookmark it. I've bookmarked one here at Bally, Bally Lesson, uh, which is not too far, just west of the Giants Ring. Um, so it's here, I don't see it. So if I click on this, um, it'll take me to that. There, I, I, now I'm, I'm zoomed in too much, so I have to zoom back and then it appears. Now, this is where it starts to get a little bit difficult. These green dots tend to get a bit lost. It's okay when you see a green dot in the middle of a field, but the green dot I was gonna look at was the one over here. It's in amongst a little clump of, clump of trees. It's even harder to see if I change my layers back to the ortho uh, photography. Now, believe it or not, there is a green dot in there, but because the background screen is very hard to see, if I click on the little green dot, uh, see if I can get it there, there you go. Uh, gives me the Sites and Monuments Register number. It says an enclosure, date uncertain, and uh, it's Bally Cairn. Um, one of the links that anything underlined here is a link. Now, this is where it starts to get really useful. And it's kind of, uh, it's, it's not so obvious. This little tool it says link to the NISMR. So basically, it's a database entry, a text based. So it tells you more about what that, that, that dot is. So if I, if I click on it now, are you seeing that? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Um, this, is, this is what it looks like, you know, a little bit of text description there. You might not be able to read it because the resolution on your, over the Zoom here, but it gives you a little bit of text describing um, the, uh, the site. Uh, in this case, it's just basically it's just describing the heights of the bank and, um, um, and what's north of it and things like that. The other thing that's in here is where it says related documents. So there's a related document to this particular site. It's a PDF file. Right, so if I, if I click on that, it'll open up a scanned image of the original file that the, well, it would have been Department of Finance probably back then, whenever they assessed this. So if I click on the pages, old typewriter stuff, um, January 1992. And there's the handwritten form that whoever the archaeologist was, I uh, can't read it at the bottom there. Usually they put their names in, um, their initials in at the bottom. So this is all the information that the government knows about this particular site that was recorded when it was first, when the survey was first done. So if I go back, okay. So we're back into the the aerial now. So that every one of these dots has a matching database entry, which is a place to start in terms of trying to find out a little bit about the area now. What I was really interested in here was these fields. This is a, looks like applied field. I don't know what they'll be doing in it. Um, maybe getting it ready for see, for sewing or something. But there's a, there's a line down the middle. Was, these are just two different flights um, done by the Ordnance Survey in Northern Ireland. So if I go back over to my layer list here and I choose the 2018 one, that is that dry summer. 
remembering to switch the previous one off. It's only showing this one, but look what shows up in this field. Now, this is not recorded. Well, it is recorded on the site's monuments register now. Uh, I, I reported it, but there looks like a like a Barrow Cemetery or something. I'm not an, ar an archaeologist, but uh, just because I happened to click on a different year, you didn't see that at all in the previous year. So it's worthwhile clicking both the Ordnance Survey, the current one, and the 2018 one. And this is what you can do. You can just scan over your um, over your map looking for things. <clears throat> I go back to the current one. I'll zoom in this another little area here. You can see one of the old field boundaries still showing up there, the little uh, dark line showing up. If I actually zoom in here. You can see like a double line. See it there? There's, there's a line there, there's a line underneath it. This looks like it was an old trackway or an old laneway. It actually goes on across here as well. But it's not visible. So it'd be interesting if, if you're doing a study in this area, well, where does that wee lane go to? It goes this way. But that's all we can see. So the first step would be, for example, this is how I would do it. I would go to the first series six inch maps to have a look at it to see in the 1830s, was there anything else there that is different from what we see now? No, there isn't. There is the lane there. If I click it back on again, right. There's nothing there in the field, but there is a bit of a, a house in the field here. A house probably with an, with, with an outbuilding. Click back again to the aerial. It's not there, can't see it. Okay, so just go to the 1860s one then, switch the 1831 off, switch the 1861 on. So I have to switch my aerial off. Can't see anything, so I need to zoom back a little bit. There's our houses, and lo and behold, there's lots of field boundaries in here. Still no sign of a lane, which would have been in here. I'll click back just so you can see it in the current one. I'll zoom in again. There's the little lane, the double lines, the lane is there. Switch it back off again, I'll zoom back out. There's nothing there. So maybe this was a very old laneway that was in existence before the 1830s maps. Um, you can see Drumbo Rectory there, the lovely formal garden there as well, uh, which doesn't exist, it's just a field now. Um, so if I continue to look maybe at the 1900s one, uh, six inch map, the very bottom of the screen there, I click the 1860s one off, click the 1900 ones on. Ah, now in the same area we're seeing um a laneway going across the field just to, just to confirm that i go back to the ordinance the aerial there's our double lines there you can't really see them at this zoom level but they are there the same area and here's our laneway so it's it's worth checking even the newer maps because uh, at first i thought this was uh, a pre-1830s trackway going across but it's not well, not according to the maps. In reality, it may have been there. I mean, it was obviously heading away out this way somewhere. Um, so as, I'm just using this as an illustration of how you can click these layers on and off, looking at the environment around the area that you want to investigate. And it starts to tell a story. We can see the house is there in 1900, but the outhouse is gone. And obviously it's not there at all now. Um, So you get an idea of what you can do with this. Um, again, the hardest thing is seeing the dots. I mean, there's two green dots there on top of a contoured hill. 
which is probably a wrath, let's click on it. Air photograph site, it says. Click the other one, again, air photograph, possible enclosure. Um, you just have to be very careful and, and look at it. It's much easier to see it actually um, on the base layer. If I switch the six inch maps off altogether and get back to our modern day one, it's much easier to see them. Okay, so that's a brief outline of these layered area of, um, especially the six inch maps, it's really gonna to start to tell, you, tell a story. Um, the next little icon across on the top is the ruler. Uh, it's, it's a measurement tool, for example, if you wanted, and there are those two uh, aerial uh, photograph sets, you can measure the distance between those. The center one is distance measuring, the very first one is an area measuring thing, which you may want to use, but the distance one is quite interesting to use. If you want to know how far those two things are apart, uh, just click it once, choose the measurement uh, unit. I'm going to choose meters. And I'm going to click over the one green dot. A little bookmark thing appears. Draw, dr just drag the mouse across to the second one and do a double click. And then it tells me there those two sites are 65 meters apart. This is quite useful if you find a wrath or something and you want to see what the diameter of the wrath is or what width the ditch is, you, you, can, you can actually measure it on this. So that's, that's the measuring tool. This one, the next one over on the measuring tool is just its location. It's kind of interesting to use this um, because if you want to then go to Google Earth or Google Maps, uh, it, Google Earth and Google Maps uses latitude and longitude for its positioning, for its coordinate system. Uh, uh, so if you wanted the, the longitude and latitude of that point, click on it and it displays it there. And I'll show you how to do this later if I have time. We can, we can copy this, uh, the latitude and longitude, paste it into Google Maps or Google Earth, and it will show you exactly where that is uh, in, in the more modern maps. So that's the measuring tool. Uh, this one is spatial searches. No idea what it does. Can't get it to do anything. It just doesn't do anything. Um, the next one over, which is a, a dotty box and a solid box. This is really interesting to use this. Um, what I'm going to do, first of all, is choose two layers. So I'm going back to my layers tab. I'm going to choose to make visible the, um, the current Ordnance Survey of Northern Ireland Aerial. So I click that, gets that up. I'm also going to click the, say, the second series six inch maps. Okay, it's underneath this, so you're not going to see it. Let's go up to this little icon here. And I'm going to choose off a drop down this tier or the photography. And it splits the screen in two with a little slider bar up the middle. So on the left hand side, you can see the modern um, Ordnance Survey aerials. And underneath it is the second series maps. So you can see what it, was, what it looked like back in the 1860s. So it's a great way of interactively, you can see there was, see all the houses there now, there's nothing there, just one or two houses. Um, this is one of the really great, interest, interesting tools um, of the Sites and Monuments Register, the split screen ability. Um, it's, it's so good, it's, it's, especially when you're trying to see, you can't understand what you're looking at. It's very easy to compare it with the aerial and the, the and you can have any map in here. You can have the 1900s. You can have the um, the 1830s one as well. Uh, I just picked the 1860s because it had field boundaries on it and tells you a little bit more. Very, very useful tool. I'm not going to bother with these other ones to do with um, color, creating your own dots and things like that. Um, I'm, I'm very conscious of time because I, want, I need to move on quickly to uh, Google Earth. So I'm going to go back um, 
to my ruler. Okay, and uh, there's a green dot in the middle there. You can't see it against the green, but it look, you can see a dark green circle around it there. Looks like it might be a wrath. There's another one over there. I'm going to measure, get its location. So I'm going to choose this one to get its location. Click it once. Go over to where the dot is. Click once again. And it populates that with longitude and latitude. So I'm now going to highlight that with my mouse, both of them. And I'm going to right mouse click and copy it to the clipboard. Now I'm going to go over to Google Earth Pro. So I'll, if you remember, I've just copied this to the clipboard and we'll use that in a second or two. I'll just, so I'll, set, I'll start that again. On the left hand side, the white panel here is just a list of things that I have saved that I wanted to get back to easily. So I can just click on them and it'll zoom back to those, those places. Whenever you load um, Google Earth first, um, I'll just zoom way, way, way back here. This is what it looks like. Whenever you load Google Earth, this is what it looks like. You can spin the globe around. You can go to the northern end of Greenland if you want. Um, I have Northern Ireland set as my default one. So if I, on my wee bookmarks thing here, I've got starting location. If I click on it, you'll see it'll zoom in. Okay. Now, remember uh, a few minutes ago, I copied the longitude and latitude of that particular green dot to my clipboard. I'm now going to paste it in here, click into the search, right mouse click again and do paste. And those two latitudes and longitudes are um, popped up there. I think I need to put a comma in between those two just to separate them and then do search. And away I'll go. Remember, it was down that, down that Bali lesson area. There we go. Same field, but we're now looking at a different set of data from the Ordnance Survey aerial. And it's a lot, it's a lot clearer. You can see a large dark green circle there, plus another feature over here. A couple of parallel lines here, maybe some apron fields around it. Uh, so, so you um, every aerial you look at uh, from a different year, a different provider will tell you another aspect of the story of the site that you're looking at. So this is Google Earth. Um, now, the most, one of the most useful things in Google Earth is on the top toolbar here. I'm not going to go through this whole toolbar because it'd be far too much. Um, there's one there where it's a little clock. You can see it's highlighted at the minute in blue. A little clock with an arrow going anti-clockwise. How they work out these icons, I have no idea. Uh, but what 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 this does is it pops up this bar here. You see this, this see this bar, this long blue bar, and each little tick on the that, on that bar represents a different aerial flight. Okay, so. I'm going to click the arrow at, at the side here to make it jump to the next one. I can't quite see what that says there, what year that is, it's something 2021. Now you can see it's, it must be a crop on the field. It's starting to show up these features very nicely. And this circular looks like a wrath. There seems to be a darker splodge in the middle. This is very interesting. Again, if I go back up to my slider, I used to click again, going left. Now it's a different crop. This looks like potatoes, I think. Can't see it quite so well. So I keep on going. That's 19, again, I can't see it. Uh, yeah, the, the dates there, um, July, 2021 is what you're looking at. Click again. Well, the screen was split there. I'll go back one step the other way, click the other arrow. You can see there's a there's two different flights there just happen to be uh, merged. I need to keep going back. This one is February 2021. Again, you can't see anything. It looks like there's clouds or something over it. That's April 2020. Again, you can start to see a little bit more detail. So each layer 
that you go back each each flight you go back and google earth shows you a little bit more i'm just going to quickly keep it on going back here so you see what each one looks like that looks much the same <coughs> that one you can't see it at all yeah it feels plied at this time may 2019 it's plied can't see it at all that's again one of these split flights two, two different flights it happens to overlap there 2019, still not there, nothing there really. You can sort of see it there, with those two features. 2018, uh, it looks like a crop partially growing there, so again, you can't see anything. So it's worthwhile clicking back through all of these um, to build up the picture of the features that you're looking at. And there's loads of them. I'm gonna keep clicking here. <clears throat> and there are sometimes there might only be one flight that shows a feature and that's where it starts to get interesting i'm going to show you one here um if i can find it I'm going to zoom out and go to the locale area. Everybody knows me probably getting bored about this. Now, this is my favourite field at the minute. Um, again, I go up to my slider. Um, it's still sitting at May 2010. I'm going to go up to the modern day, slide it up. That's what it looks like. May 2021. You can see Bishop's Court area field on the left-hand side there. It, not really showing anything. Just looks like a normal field with a crop. Click back to March 2020. Yeah, a few tractor marks there. I think if there's been somebody in the field with a scrambler bike there, I think as well. But still, there's still no features that you, you could say was anything looking like archaeological. 2019, still nothing. It just looks like a crop in the field. Slightly different greens there in places, but no discernible pattern. 2019, again, it's looking a bit weird. Uh, maybe it's been partially cut there. Um, now we're in 2018, that dry summer, July 2018. Now we can start to see features. And it only started to show up in 2018. The more modern flights, it didn't show up at all. So I'm illustrating here the that you really have to go through every single one of these uh, flights looking for um, your, your, your target. Again, I'm going to keep on clicking back. 2017, can't see it at all. Same as 17, 16, still not there, still not there, still not there. And back to 1985 where it's so coarse you can't see anything. So you see the importance of of going back, looking through all the years in, in this slider. This is the single most useful um, tool in, in Google Earth. Um, there are others. Um, I'm going to see if I can uh, show you what. I, I flew this field with the drone just to let you see what it looks like because um, we have been doing some work to it. That's the same field flown with the drone with a lot of enhancement done to the crop marks. And you can see loads of different things. You can see some old but not very old straight field boundaries. But th this whole feature here showed up uh, last year. This was flown in 2020, just last year. Um, absolutely amazing detail um, whenever the image is enhanced. So this is the process that I go through and try to find a site. Um, this still needs interpreted by uh, the experts who you know more about what they're looking at than I. This is a church site, an ecclesiastical site right by the river here uh, with the apron enclosures. This one here is a bit of an anomaly. Three archaeologists I've spoken to said it, well, they weren't coming out right and saying, what they thought it was, but they said it kind of looks more prehistoric to me. That's what they were saying. Uh, there's actually three 
um, three banks and ditches there. Um, but like all archaeology, until you dig it, you're not going to know what it is. So if I go back to my Google Earth. OK, you all see that? Yep. Yeah? We're back in Google Earth. Yes. Yep. Yeah. OK. So how I would go about looking for things is just by literally scanning, just dragging my mouse around every year, looking for circular features, unusual shaped features. Uh, you've got to be very careful, of course. Some things are not archaeological. If I pick this one, I'll zoom to it now. We... In a field here, you can see we've got long lines and ditches. This is a typical herringbone drain, uh, drainage pattern, which is modern, of course. But just beside it, to the left of it, is our, you can see these wavy lines, which, which look like rivers. They probably were rivers at one time, and maybe when it floods, these, these would be filled with water. But not, now they're dry, but there's different vegetation growing in them, which is showing up that it was a water channel at one time. Um, and the term that uh, archaeologists use for this is a paleo channel. It's a channel of water that existed um, with more substance years ago uh, than it does now. Uh, and again, there are certain archaeological features that you find in, a, in, a, in an area like this, um, like burnt mounds, for example, quite often appear uh, close to a, a paleo, which shows up now as a paleo channel which would have been in a small stream at one time, back in the prehistoric times or even historic times. So that, that's the two things that you're actually seeing here is one, the modern herringbone and the, this traditional uh, natural drainage. But you've got to be very careful at interpreting these, of course. Um, the other one, um, which is famous uh, for people interpreting wrongly, is this one, not this one, things like this. Um, I remember somebody contacted me once and said, uh, oh, I've found a Bronze Age village with, with huts. It's a hut circle. And um, what these are is the, the scars left behind by a cattle feeder, one of those metal cattle feeders in the wintertime where they feed the cattle. And the cattle walk around in a circle, eating the silage out of the middle and pooing in a, in a ring, which causes the dark circle. But it kind of looked like drip lying on, on, a, on, a, um, on, a, on a bronze age hut, except if you measured it. If you measured these, they'd be about two meters across. You know, while a, hut, a bronze age hut, I don't know what it is, but seven, six, seven, eight, nine meters across. But it's very easy to think, oh, I'll find a village, uh, a hut circle, and, that, and that's not what it is at all. Um, sometimes, I'll pick another one here, it's just going to fly to it. Here's two, two more cattle feeders, just, just, the, just the scars left from it. But up at the top, just know that you can see very faint, you know, even two or three years later, these scars uh, and the crop mark can still appear. Um, so you've got to be very careful not to, not to confuse these with archaeology. Um, some other things that I've found, um, This one's near Newton Ours. We fly up towards Newton Ours. I'll just zoom back a little bit there first of all. This is the dual carriageway between Dundald out this way and uh, Newton Ours this way. Um, well, if I zoom in here, the middle of the crop, we've got an unusual shaped circle with an entrance with a blob in the middle, which is probably the settlement area. This, this one was not on the sites of monuments, right? It's just looking like a wrath. Um, that's what they're, they're thinking. Certainly settlement, um, early Christian, probably, period. Um, but then just quite close by, I noticed another little circle, very, very subtle one. I'm going to try and zoom out. I hope you can see it. A little small circle there. 
which looks more like a barrow or, or certainly a ring ditch of some sort. And that is not on the site of Monitor's Register either. So just by scanning around, you'll find these things. Um, some of the more interesting ones, uh, one that we did resistivity on was Ring Creevy near Cumber. Get a bit dizzy here. Again, I'll zoom back and let you see just where exactly that it was. This is um, Ray Island, Island Hill, Island Hill Car Park here. Uh, and Harry Hamilton's field. I drove up this far, not knowing who it was, and it turned out I actually knew the guy. He goes to our church. <laughs> and uh, here we've got a lovely plectrum ship enclosure, which we did resistivity over last year. And also uh, what looks like two barrows just outside of it. Again, all found. Uh, it's not on every year. That's 2017. If I go to another year, well, it's plowed there, I'm not seeing anything. Another year, still plowed. Still nothing, really. So you've got to go through a uh, lovely picture of clouds there. Even the more modern ones, I took way up the modern. Uh, it's used as a scrambler field as well. But again, no sign of it. It's only in that 2017 that that showed up. And if you look at a carefully, you can actually see a, like a trackway coming out of the entrance here, heading down towards the sea. It's actually heading towards a wet spot. You see this wet, this darker spot here um, in, in the ploughed field. That's always wet. The farmer tells me that he stuck a drain into that to drain it off, and it's, and it's still always wet. So it may have been a well at one time, but it looks like it's quite it's in line with this uh, entrance coming out here. So again, we're telling the story of this site just by looking at aerial maps. Uh, one of the more unusual ones, uh, I'll zoom back out again, I'll fly to it, uh, White Abbey. On, on the mudflats of White Abbey. We've got a site that was known about before, um, but there's th at least four ships here, one large ship, um, smaller one beside it, another one here, and another one down here. There's the shore road there. And uh, one more. This is Carry Ray, it's near Donachadee. We've got another circular type enclosure, not on the SMR, uh, with another enclosure outside of it. And if you screw your eyes up very carefully, um, inside of this outer circle here, there's like partitions, um, like ditches, um, with another circular feature on the inside. So it's quite an unusual feature. Um, I've got permission from the uh, landowner to do uh, resistivity over this area uh, which has been on the list since before COVID so it's one that we will be doing. Um, so that, how are we for time? Uh, that's about an hour I've been going, right? You all right for another 15 minutes? Everybody okay for another 15 minutes? Yep. Yes, yes that's fine. Yeah. Um, so that's the basic tools of Google Earth and how you can link the longitude and latitude of your spot from the sites of monuments register to Google Earth. Because you won't get all those details that I've shown you just there now in the uh, sites of monuments register. Okay, I'm gonna go stop sharing here for a second. Okay, welcome back. <laughs> this is another site. Um, website um it's, it's it's sorry it's called living atlas dot arc gis now, don't try and remember it now but you can come back again look at the youtube video you can you can get the the web address from the top of this this is again another data set that is different from google earth 
it's different from all the data sets in Google Earth. It's different from the Ordnance Survey, um, uh, Northern Ireland aerials that, that you get in the Sites and Monuments Register. So again, it's another layer of data over an area um, that you might want to investigate. Um, and again, it's typical, it's got a left-hand pane here showing the years, uh, uh, which you can look at just by clicking on them. Uh, this particular one um, is uh, a site near Khalif Castle. There's Khalif Castle there. I'll zoom back out to get your reference point. Um, Strangford's up here, Khalif's down here. And Khalif Castle uh, is in here. But away over here where it says Glebe Road, there is a site on the site of monuments register. There is a church site um, actually in this field here. And it says it is located and it gives you the, the reference number and all for it. Uh, and I've looked at this, these two fields here um, th through all the previous Google Earth. I've looked at it all. Can't see any hint, not even the slightest hint of a church or anything that might look like it. Um, I think this one beside the church, there was, it said St. Peter's Leper Hospital, 14th century, I think it was. No sign of anything there at all. So I went on to this World Image Wayback site um, and I just clicked through. I'm going to zoom in a wee bit to get this more central on the screen for you. Here's our two fields that were supposed to have the church and leper hospital in it. Um, and I click another year. Still nothing. 2017. Still nothing. Zoom in a wee bit more. 2016. Nothing in nothing in these two fields here uh, where the church and upper hospital is supposed to be. But over here, we have got circular concentric crop marks showing up again. Several of them, in fact. Um, and what looks like a possible trackway or road going through the middle of it. Um, this has now been reclassified by HED as this being the leper hospital, not away over there uh, to our left. So again, just by scarring over this, we've I've been able to update um, information. This is a very lovely field to do resistivity over as well, but we don't know the owner of it. Um, um, we've got far too big a list to do. We've got to get um, another field at Balnahari done first for Barry before we do anything else. Um, but it just shows you this one year. It didn't show up in any of these other years here at all. 2006, that's the same year in October. Not, and this, this was in December. So it's really worthwhile being diligent. And I, I, it can be boring if you're not into this, but it can be really satisfying when you discover new sites uh, which have never been seen before. Uh, so that's really basically my talk, really a quick skirmish into the three main aerial mapping type tools that I use to try to find places. Um, there's one other site that you might find useful, not to do with maps, but to find out more about a name, and that's place names um, NI. Let's see if I can get that up for you. Place names NI. It's .org, it's called. So with this site, uh, if you go to the home page of it, you can type in any name here. Um, for example, these are names I've looked at before. Um, Ballymoran. Um, so what does Ballymoran mean? What does it, you know, what, what's the Irish equivalent or whatever? If you click on Ballymoran and do a search, it's a townland name. It gives me a list uh, of the place names: Ballymoran Bay, Ballymoran Close. That's a street. It's Ballymoran, where and near Calinchy that we're interested in. If I click on it. It tells me the background name. It tells me where it is. Um, it, it, 
it tells me it's linked to the to Nendrum actually, because the church in Ballymoran took over from Nendrum when Nendrum closed. Um, it tells you about that. Um, there's additional information for previous names that Ballymoran was known as. It's got all listed here. And the document reference that is getting that information from. When Beale Maron, it was called in 1625, and it was in the Raven Maps as that. And the link uh, doesn't take you to the Raven Maps now, it takes you just to a more detailed click on it there as to what the reference is. You need to go and look up um, uh, the maps yourself, which are very easy to see in Bangor Museum. So that's place names in Idor. Very useful for finding out what a name means. Uh, and again, it's adding another layer of information, uh, trying to tell the story of the site that you're interested in. So that so that's me as a brief skirmish into this. I know it's a bit of a uh, um, bit of a charge through this, um, but the YouTube video is going to be made available there, and you can sit back through it and do section at a time if you weren't so sure about some of these things. Uh, so anybody, any questions? I didn't mean to stop actually during this at various points to ask if anyone had any questions, uh, but we'll just leave it to the end now because I really needed to rattle on with it. Uh, it took longer than I thought. I didn't tie myself, by the way, so it is a workshop after all. You can put your microphone on if you want. And have a... There's a lot of information to assimilate. David. Oh, it is. It is. That's why Very we're useful. making it available uh, as a... Uh, as a go back to YouTube. Yeah. Is the same available for the South of Ireland? Yes, more or less. Um, uh, th there is a site of monuments register for the Republic of Ireland. Um, uh, you can get to that by um, going back to that Heritage NI page. Uh, it's actually listed as one of the uh, uh, links there that I listed in, in my own web page there. Okay, that's very handy. There were 10 questions here coming up in the chat. Do you want me to just fire through them? Yeah. John uh, Convery, good to get that email. Oh, thank you. Um, Pat, George, you need to mute. No, I can't see anything. Okay, this is, this is early on. Uh, Patrick McGovern, that was excellent to you. Thank you very much for the information. Trevor. Thanks, David. It's excellent. Very useful workshop. Excellent workshop. Oh, there's Louise popping up the actual direct link going to the Republic's um, um, Sites and Monuments Register there. Louise Moffat, if you go to the chat window, um, Louise just popped it up there. Tells you more or less the same sort of information, but for the for, for the, the Republic of Ireland. Okay, David, if I may just say thank you very much indeed on behalf of us all for a very comprehensive uh, overview of what the various mapping tools that are available um, on the internet, which you know we can all use to do our research or just to have a, a look around any particular area of interest. And I say so, you, you've covered a lot of ground. I mean, literally. There was and, uh, we're flying about there. <laughs> absolutely. So, um, you know, a lot of people may want to sort of check out the uh, YouTube recording because you've given us so much information to think about. So, thank you indeed for that. And uh, certainly well worth checking out David's own website and all the various links that he has there. Yeah. And so, I suggest to everybody just have a play with these tools because they really are actually quite uh, easy to use once you get used to them. And um, just a bit of practice gets, gets you there. So uh, again, thank you, David, from us all. Um, it's, thank you. It's very useful, and uh, that, that, that's great. Uh, anybody else got any uh, questions they want to ask quickly before David uh, shuts us down? Thank you very well, much, David. Well, if you think of anything, I'm sure you can email them. Um, so if anybody wants to give them a quick round of applause, thanks very much, David. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, David. Yeah, that was thank great. You. Thank you. Thanks very much, David. Excellent. Thank you. David, that was really good. I assume that you, 
uh, a large monitor be very useful looking at these maps? They are, yes. Uh, I have my screen resolution set to a lower resolution for Zoom. Uh, my own monitor here is a, um, a 4K uh, 36 inch screen. So yes, a big monitor does help. <laughs> okay. also, also, it's pretty hard to do on, uh, you can't use Google Earth on an, on an iPad, unfortunately, um, but it is available for the laptops, the Mac laptops. And it's almost identical to the PC version that I was demonstrating there. Oh, it's incredibly powerful tools. Like, you know, we're we're getting advantage free, we're getting free access to all these satellite images. And, yeah. and I, 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 I didn't even touch on some of them, I mean, especially the sites of monuments register. Like, for example, um, they, they've now created a new layer of all uh, commercial archaeological digs that have gone on in terms of investigation for a building going up. You know, it's a statutory thing now you have, to, the developer has to um, have an archaeological report done before they, uh, before they start to build. And it's, it's the commercial archaeology companies that usually do those. Their reports are now online and, and as a layer there on the Sites and Monuments Register. So again, it's another one to check. Somebody could be just put a barn in or something and did foundations and find a shell midden. I know that actually happened. Um, you know, a prehistoric shell midden. Um, so th there's lots of wee hidden things in their way in there. You know, they're they're buried. Um, another example, one I was talking uh, with uh, Duncan there uh, a while ago. Um, I was quite interested in the um, Castle Bawn which is in Newton Ards. It's a name of a shopping center. I thought, well, what the, why is it called Castle Bourne? And it's only when I went into the Sites and Monuments Register and I looked, uh, that there, there was and still is a bond around an enclosure right in the middle of Newton Ards. It's all a scheduled area. And, uh, you know, and it, it had loads of documents. When I went to the database bit, loads of research documents that the research had already been done the uh, Montgomery manuscripts, quotes were there, O'Laverty's uh, uh, screenshots from his book was there, um, everything that was done for you. So there's a lot of tools there, but it's hidden away in there by clicking that, those links um, when you click on the wee dot. So explore, click, go mad. Hey, David. Yes. Uh, if you if you want to uh, use any of this information, if you want to sort of quote it as it were to publish it online or on paper, do you actually have to seek permission, actual permission from Google or whoever? Google, yes. Um, you don't have to physically contact them. If um, at the bottom of the screen on a Google Earth image, there'd be a little bit of text and say something like Airbus or Mac Maxor in 1990 or something. And a wee Google symbol, a wee copyright symbol in Google. If you just quote that, uh, right. um, that, that's all. There. I mean, nobody ever really checks up on it, but it's just to give them due credit. Um, yeah. um, uh, the Sites of Monuments Register, there is that wee bit of text at the bottom of the screen where it gives the Crown copyright. Um, there's another fact that's not really um, widely known. The, <laughs> The Sites and Monuments Register that you saw, all those green dots, it's available as an open source data set that can actually be loaded into Google Earth. So that means all your green dots of your archaeological sites can be loaded into Google Earth and used, and it's open source. It's called an uh, open government license, which means you do not... Uh, I actually contacted HED about it because I wasn't quite sure um, if this, in fact, could be used. And they said, yes, use away. Let us know if you're going to use it because we'd be interested as to what you're using it for, you know. So, But there's no legal requirement. Um, it, it is open source. Open government license, it's called. In fact, that copyright message that pops up when you first go into the Sites and Monuments Register, another bit of that gobbledygook text there, it actually says in there that is open government license and it's available 
Um, I'm going to be doing a few more shorter YouTube videos on my own uh, YouTube page as to how to do this sort of thing, how to get the Sites and Monuments Treasure into Google Earth, because that's a huge advantage. Um, because you can look back all the years that Google have ever flown and still see the green dots of the archaeological sites. Um, really useful. Very good, thank you. A question for David on uh, Google Earth. Uh, is there a fee or is there a lot of memory re required for utilizing that? Yeah, I love free things. Um, <laughs> in fact, I use very few paid things. Yes, Google Earth is free. Um, no license at all. Um, you, they just like you to quote their wee copyright symbol thing if you ever happen to reproduce yes. it. Um, um, it's not for a very heavy um, overhead on your computer. It does use your internet because it's downloading those maps over the internet. So if your internet is quite slow um, at downloading normally, it just will take a bit longer for those layers. Um, if you change year, for example, in Google Earth, um, it just it might not happen quite as quick as what's happening here. I'm, I'm on 200 megabits per second fiber fiber broadband here but i'm spoiled um but uh yeah i can slow it down a wee bit and also if your computer was an old one uh, maybe it doesn't yeah. um uh, a, a very old one it might slow it down and it might grind to a stop <laughs> uh, just depending on its age really yes computers go out of date very quickly I know it's it's crazy. Um, uh, anytime I update my computer, I have to try to future proof it, but that means spending a lot of money getting the, <laughs> the very latest thing. But at least it future proofs me for five or six years. But uh, yeah, yeah, the workstation I'm using here it does all this stuff. It's all it's it's about five or six years old and it's still mm -hmm. nipping along nicely. And uh, um, Microsoft is trying to compete with uh, Google, isn't that right at the moment? Um. Well, Google doesn't They're do any of this themselves. Unfortunately, they they use um, uh, Microsoft use uh, Bing imagery, yeah. um, yes. which is the same imagery that Apple use. Yes, uh, on their Macs for for uh, for, for the aerials. Um, so it's one way uh, of doing. It. If you're on a PC and you you want to get Apple aerial yes. maps, it's difficult but not impossible. Again, I have a link on that list on my own website there. We saw those blue buttons. There's a link there if you're on a PC to be able to see uh, Apple uh, Arial as well. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes. yes, they're always competing, unfortunately. Yes, good. Excellent talk, by the way, David. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. There's another thing I'm interested in maps. Yeah. I quite often don't find the recent Ordnance Survey maps accurate. I remember one time having to apply for planning permission and uh, argue with planning permission that there wasn't a house next door where you're supposed to notify adjoining owners and had to send them a Google aerial uh, photograph of the site to show them it was a green field. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> boundaries is, is another thing. Uh, yes. More recently in a, in a helping with a boundary dispute. And uh, but which one's right? <laughs> you know? Yes, of course. <laughs> it's what's on the title deeds of your... Of your of, of 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 your house this is one of the counts, I think. Yes, of course. Of course. Because, oh, no, cows taking out that bird. Right. I think if everybody's uh, finished their questions for now, um, I think maybe we should uh, wrap it up for this evening. Um, I'm sure if anything else uh, comes to mind, you could. Uh, perhaps uh, email David, and I'm sure he'll help you out, or I'll try to as well, if you have any further questions. Um, sorry to interrupt you, but John Convery has asked a question there. Oh, is he? Sorry. Uh, sorry, John. What's looking at? Where is he? Scroll down to the end. Where? I can't see that one. Where is he? Uh, John is asking, can you lay your own footage you take by drone on the Google Earth Maps? So, you know, he's trying to ask the question, can you yes. 
update that? You know, that's that's interesting. Yes. That's an interesting question, actually. Yes, um, uh, Google Earth um, is just a typical program. It's got a file menu, and it's got a file open menu. If you go to the file open menu, um, there's loads of different file formats. Um, it can load in. It needs to be geo-referenced in some way so it knows geographically where to place the imagery. But most drone imagery is geo-referenced. Uh, so if you have a geo-tiff file, which is the usual format for aerial imagery from a drone, you just do file and open and boom, it just shows up plonk right over top of where it's supposed to be. Yeah. These are all the things in Google Earth that I want to try and do shorter YouTube videos on just to try to help people uh, if they're having to wade through a bit of a marathon that we, that, that we did tonight. But yes, um, geo-referenced imagery from a drone will show up bang over top of where it's supposed to be in Google Earth. I was going to show a little bit of that, but I just ran out of time. <laughs> okay, David, I think we'll just uh, finally wrap up now and say again, thanks very much, Ms. Say It's been very, very useful.